Hi everyone and welcome to West Side Church. I'm Eddie and happy Victoria Day long weekend. I hope you've been enjoying some time to relax and finding creative ways to have fun. The warm weather is finally here and is definitely helping my mood. I think most of us are just as excited to go outside and enjoy the outdoors. And we're so glad that you've taken some time out of this weekend to be with us. Today we're concluding our series, more than enough and we'll be talking about how you can live a successful life so you're definitely going to want to stick around because it's going to be worth your while we have some music and at the end of the message today we have some exciting opportunities that you can be part of so i'll see you in a bit and here's the last message from our series more than enough So when I was a kid, I was a really fast runner. Now, this is going to sound a little bit like I'm bragging because I sort of am, but just to kind of curb that off, uh, I will tell you that as an adult, I am no longer a fast runner. I'm a really slow runner. So just indulge me for a second as I relive the glory days. But when I was a kid, I was really fast and I loved to play sports. And I found that when I played sports, um, I almost always had an advantage with my speed. I was never the biggest, I was never the strongest. In fact, for most of my childhood, I was one of the smallest, but I was also almost always one of the fastest in whatever I was doing. And I loved to play sports and and I loved that I could use my speed um, to, to help me in whatever I was doing. And not only playing sports, but I ran a lot of track and field as a kid. And I, I, I used to, I was, I was really fast, so I used to win a lot of medals. I would compete at the school level, and I would always win those races. And then I would go to the county level, and I would win medals there. And uh, even throughout my childhood, I would run in some provincial races, and I won medals there. And I used to have a lot of fun for a long time running races, because I really enjoyed doing it. But... I also enjoyed the intention that it brought me. So I can still remember as an adult that in elementary school, after a track meet, and I had won some medals at the county meet, I can remember the principal of our elementary school, who was kind of an athletic guy. He was into sports. And even though we were just in elementary school, he was really excited that someone from our school did really well in a county meet. And so I remember he came and he found me um, on on recess, and he just wanted to talk about it. And and he was really excited and and happy and kind of proud for our school. Uh, That's stayed with me because I just really like that attention. I can remember later in my life as a teenager and being on a, a track and field team for this school and we, we competed in this provincial meet and I remember I was in three events and I won medals in all the events that I were in and afterwards there was a school-wide Uh, assembly. And I remember the coach singled me out of everybody on the team, the whole school, big school, um, and and kind of praising what I had done and the medals that I had won. And it was actually something that I became known for in my childhood, that whether it was on the baseball diamond or track and field or whatever we were doing, people sort of knew me as the kid that was really fast. In fact, as an adult, a, a number of years ago, as an adult, I ran into the father of a childhood friend that I had had. And I hadn't seen anybody from this family probably for over 20 years, but I ran into this guy and we sort of recognized each other and then figured out uh, who we were. And so we started talking and he goes, oh man, Dave Steimers, you were so fast as a kid. Like the one thing he remembered from all the way through my childhood is that I was fast. Like it became part of what people thought about when they knew who I was, especially if we were connected through sports or track and field or something like that. And I tell you this because as I went along the way, I I spent some time really enjoying running, but there also came a point where I started to not enjoy it so much. I started to feel like there was all this pressure, that every time I went to a track meet or or even sometimes when I was playing sports, there was so much expectations on me that there was this, this, not just, oh, we're going to go and have fun or we're going to have, enjoy running this race, but it was like, this is who you are, Dave. And so if you're not as fast as we think you are, or if you don't do as well, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't succeed the way that everybody expects you to, then I thought, well, maybe I'm going to lose some of that attention or people aren't going to admire me the same way. People aren't going to think uh, that I'm as good as, as they used to think and there's something to lose. And so I started to feel at certain times that I wasn't enjoying running or playing sports, but that there was this, this weight on me, this burden. 
And the reason was because it wasn't just something that I did. It was becoming something that I was, something that people knew about me. There was this connection between the things that I was doing and who I was, who I saw myself to be and who other people saw me to be. And I tell you that because I think a lot of us struggle with that and what that really means in our lives. We struggle with what it means to be a success. And probably for you, it's not running races, although it could be. But probably for many of us, there's something different, something that we attach our identity to in terms of success. If I'm doing this well, or if people are recognizing me for this, or if I have these things, then that's a measure of whether or not I'm being successful in my life. And what happens is we, we start to attach our identity and gauge whether or not we're doing well or we're being successful in life based on how we're doing in some of these areas of our lives. So it could be running races, but it might be your grades in school where you achieve a certain level and then you have to keep achieving that level or better because people are expecting that from you and you're the smart one in the family. You're the smart one in your group of friends and and now it becomes something that defines you and so you got to always, always, always be trying to do better and better and better. It might be your job title and what people think of you or how much money you have, how much influence you can wield. It could be how big your business is or how many people follow you on social media accounts. It could be for a lot of us even how well our kids are doing and whether or not our, our families are kind of measuring up to other people as we see uh, pictures of, of people and their, their nice, loving, beautiful, wonderful, happy families on, on Facebook or Instagram or the things that their kids are achieving, the milestones that their kids are achieving at certain ages and then we're comparing with our kids and are they doing well and are they as well-rounded and are they learning all the things and who are they becoming and that rubs off on me as a parent, or it could be things like your body image, that maybe uh, the way that you look has always been really connected with your identity and how people see you, and whether or not you're, you're the good-looking one or the muscular one, or whether you look like other people. But there's all these ways that we kind of gauge our identities, and therefore whether or not we are successful. And sometimes, well, almost all the times, they're, they're based around some really good things and things that we try and do but we can elevate them to this level where the things that we do become how we see who we are. And then we might tend to carry around a a pretty heavy weight trying to make sure that the things that we do reflect well on who we are. And so today I want to ask you, uh, what do you measure to tell you whether or not you are successful? Maybe consciously or not so consciously. What are the things in your life that you measure that are telling you whether or not you're being successful in your life? Whatever, however you define success, but whether or not you're, you're doing well. You feel good about yourself. You feel good about your priorities and your values and how you're living out your life. And again, it might be some of those things that we just talked about uh, that give you a certain validation or that help other people uh, think a certain way of you and, and that gives you a certain validation. See, I think we are at a really pivotal time in our lives because for the last 14 months, we've had this huge interruption, a massive interruption in our world. And there have been so many things that we haven't been able to do. We've had to do work differently, but then also extracurricular activities, things for our kids, uh, social activities, uh, hobbies, things that we might do outside of work or even work that we've done in in a very different way. The last 14 months have been totally different. And some of those things have been completely off the table. We haven't been able to do them at all. I am of the opinion that we're getting to the place where we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's it's not quite here yet, but as we move into the summer and through the summer, I think we're, we're going to be moving to a place where uh, things are going to start opening up and, and more options are going to be coming available in the coming months of the things that we do, where we spend our time and energy. And I think we have an opportunity to really think about what is most important to us. What do we really think is a successful life? Because when we can sort of nail that down of what we believe will really make us successful in the best possible way of defining that word, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really bleed out into the things that we do. How do we spend our time and our energy? What are our priorities and our values? And I think for some of us, we need to be really careful about what we bring back into our lives. We need to think back to what we were doing 15 months ago and ask ourselves, was our pace what we wanted our pace to be? Is our priorities where we wanted our priorities to be? Were we spending the right amount of time with our families or with our spouse, with our friends? Are we spending the right amount of time Uh, serving others and caring for our communities? 
How much time are we spending working? How much time are we spending trying to keep up with people? How, how's our family calendar going? And, and how much are we uh, investing of our time and our energy into being out and doing all kinds of stuff all the time? Is that a sustainable thing? And maybe to stop and ask ourselves, what are we going to bring back? What's going to be most important? What are we going to say no to? And can we feel good about saying yes to the things that are really going to make us successful? And my bias is what's going to make us successful in, in a deep sense, not in a superficial sense, but in a deep sense, in a spiritual sense. What makes us successful in the way that God has uh, created us and designed us to be, not only as individuals, but as a community together? What's the best way to order our lives? And what, what should we be measuring to tell us whether or not we're doing that well, whether or not we're really being successful? So today's our last uh, message in our series, More Than Enough. And we're going to look at one more parable that Jesus told from Luke chapter 16. And and I think there's a powerful message here um, to answer that question. What does real success look like? What What should we be doing and measuring in order to really be a success from Jesus' perspective? So here's the story. Luke chapter 16, I start in verse 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there, longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. We start the story with two characters, primarily. The the first is identified only as a rich man. We don't get his name. The other character is Lazarus, which, interestingly enough, literally means the one who God helps. And I want you to keep that in your mind as we read through this story. But first, we have a rich man, and all we know is he's rich. This is an intentional way of telling a story. What's his identity? What's his name? We don't know any of that. We don't know really too much about him other than the fact that he is rich. He's splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen. This is significant because um, uh, if you have purple clothing, that's a real status symbol. That means that you're somebody. In the ancient world, it wasn't like us where we can go online and, and get on Amazon and order whatever shirt in whatever color and whatever size we want. In order to dye uh, clothing a certain color, there's only really two ways to do it in the ancient world, and both were really expensive. It was only for people who would have had a lot of money. Purple is a, a color that was associated with people who are rich or even rich royalty. And so that's who this guy is. He, he's, he's dressed really nice, purple, fine linen. He lived in luxury. So comfort was a big deal to him. We know it says in the next verse that Lazarus was at his gate. So he has gates, which means he's got a big property worth a lot of money. And it's even being protected by a gate. He is a really big deal. And then we have Lazarus. Again, literally that name means the one who God helps. He's so weak and sick that he can't beg in the town square. Normally, if you were someone who was too sick to work, and so you're poor, which seems to be the case here with Lazarus, you would beg in the city, the town center, where everybody would come and do business or or go to the market. That's where people were passing by. But if you were too weak to even do that, if you couldn't even sit up and, and, and beg, where everybody was coming, then uh, perhaps your family or people that cared about you would take you to someone who's wealthy and and put you at their gate. Like this is where Lazarus ends up, at the gate of somebody who's really wealthy. And the idea here is that people would do that really believing that someone who's wealthy, like this rich guy, uh, would out of their duty, it would be their duty to take care of this guy. They would see somebody who uh, is obviously doesn't have enough and needs to be taken care of, and they obviously have the means to do it. It would be their duty to take care of them. And yet, Lazarus longs to eat the scraps from the table. In other words, the dog food. When we're all done, we throw the scraps to the dogs. And Lazarus just wishes he's so poor and he's so sick, he just wishes he could eat what the dogs eat. And yet, we see that the dogs are treated better than he is. In fact, the only care he gets, he gets none from the man who is wealthy. The only care he gets is from the dogs who would come and lick his wounds. The rich man's doing nothing to help 
bind up his wounds or care for him in any way. And so we see that they, they both die and there is quickly a really uh, quick reversal of roles. That Lazarus goes to be by the side of Abraham, the patriarch of the people of Israel. And that's obviously very uh, deep and symbolic of this intimacy with, with a forefather, with an ancestor, with somebody who's a, a, a spiritual leader of your people. So obviously in a, a really good place and, and he's, he's, he's comforted. And then the rich man who had enjoyed such luxury is now in the place of the dead and he's in torment. He, he is now experiencing the opposite of what he experienced in life. So they have completely switched places in many ways. As we go through this story, I want to talk about three pitfalls that the rich man has encountered that would be obstacles for uh, really experiencing what I think Jesus wants to express as a, a rich life or a successful life. Again, in the best sense of the word, and there's going to be some redefinition of what that is because as we see the rich man's definition in the beginning was his own comfort. Uh, my life is about avoiding suffering for me. It's kind of got this selfish edge to it. I'm making sure that I have everything that I want, enjoying luxury, and, and I am staying away from suffering, even helping somebody in suffering. But now that is switched around. So three pitfalls that I think we need to make sure that we are mindful of if we want to live a really successful life the way that Jesus is teaching us. Or even if you want to consider that, you might not be there yet. But to go, what does it mean for Jesus to live a successful life? The first pitfall I think we found in these few verses is status, wealth, and position, and the comfort, and all that go with it, we find out quickly, are temporary. We all know this. We all always talk about this, and yet, and yet the pull is so strong. We always talk about, well, you can't take it with you after you die, and oh, you're not going to be happy just because you have a lot of stuff, and yet so much of our lives revolve around trying to get more, more status, more money, Status has such this big pull. We're convinced that comfort is our goal. North America, this is huge. What's a really good life? What's a successful life? People, I think a lot of us, uh, under the surface, the way that we live says it's avoiding suffering and it's being comfortable. It's having nice things and nice homes and, and being able to, to just really enjoy life, to have some luxuries. We live life as if it's a merit. Uh, a meritocracy, which means uh, we get what we earn. And the whole goal of a rich life, a successful life, is to earn enough that we can be comfortable. And those who work hard and earn enough become comfortable and luxury. They're the successful ones. That's how many of us live. That's very much North American culture and what's pushed on us and what we should strive for. But here what we realize is that I think we have to always remind ourselves in that's all temporary. That status that comes from wealth and possessions. Look at me, I'm dressed in purple and I've got gates in my house and I've got all this comfort is a mirage. It looks so good, but there's nothing really of substance there. It's very superficial. It doesn't really lead to a deeply satisfying life. And even if you can get all that stuff, which most of us uh, can't, it's a very small percentage of people that can get to that level. But even if you can, it's just so temporary. And the reversal of roles of status really show us that, that in, in life for Jesus here, he's saying, if you think just because you've got all this temporary status right now, and everybody thinks you're great and wealthy and wonderful. Let's just be real about that. It's, it's a mirage. It's, it's so temporary. It's so fleeting. It's something that we have to say to ourselves, that can't be the measure of my success. Because if it is, it's just not strong enough to carry a, a real deep and meaningful life. And it's, it's never going to last. And I think one of the things we're going to get drawn out of this parable and so much of Jesus' teaching is that in the way that God would order the world, we don't live in a meritocracy. It's going to come out by the end of this message really clearly. The way that God wants us to live with him is not we get based on what we earn. And if you're living in that kind of way, you just know that's going to be a weight. That's going to be a burden. I've always got to work harder. I've always got to do more. I've always got to win every race so that I get the attention, so that I get the accolades, so that I get paid, so that I get what I think what I want in status. But the first thing we realize is that status quickly means nothing for, for the rich and wealthy man. Verse 24 says, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. 
But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. So notice this, the rich man in life had everything, position, power, wealth but now finds the roles are reversed. And when they are, look at his attitude. Look at what he, he does to try and solve the problem. So he's coming from this life of meritocracy. I've earned all this and I've got this status. Ignoring Lazarus, he didn't do anything to help him in this life. Then they both die, roles are switched around. And you would hope at this point that he would have woken up to a new way of living. He would have woken up and realized, oh, I get it. None of that meant anything. And I was living selfishly and I did nothing for Lazarus. And man, I need to have a change in heart. That's sort of where we would expect the story to go. He learns his lesson when everything gets switched around. But instead, he doesn't even address Lazarus. He can't even address him as a person. He goes right to Abraham. And what does he ask Abraham? Tell Lazarus to help me, to serve me, to look out for what I want. He still hasn't got it at all. He still thinks his status is higher than Lazarus and Lazarus exists to do what he wants him to do. Second pitfall is control. He still thinks that he should be in charge. He can't even address Lazarus as a person. He doesn't say, I'm so sorry, Lazarus, I ignored you and I ignored your sickness and your your poverty. I could have helped you. I could have served you, but I didn't do any of that. Instead, Lazarus is still seen in his mind as subservient. And you're here to, it's Father Abraham, get, get that poor guy to bring me some water, to help make me comfortable. Now he's into the second pitfall of control. I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge of my life. I want to be in charge of other people. And control is also a mirage. We think that we sometimes can manipulate life and outcomes and results. Oh, I'm in control. I'm in control of everything. You would have hoped when this guy died, he realized that that control was also a mirage. That control ultimately is so very temporary. And maybe we look at our lives and, and we, want, we all want control. I want, I want to be able to control my life. And, and sometimes we honestly, we want to control other people and what they think of us or how they treat us. We want to be in charge. Sometimes we want to control outcomes and results that really we don't have any control of. But we feel much safer if we can convince ourselves that we are in control And I can make sure that that people are serving me and I can get what I need. Father Abraham comes back and goes, that is not how this works. There is a deep chasm between us. I think partially, um, we're not just thinking um, this is a a, a physical, spatial issue, but even a chasm in the way you're approaching life. You you still haven't got it. You haven't been able to bridge the gap. You're not even living as a, a real human right now. When we just want to be in control, people can easily become a means to an end. We see people as, what can they do for me and, and how can they serve me? And that's obviously one of this guy's big problem. He could never serve Lazarus. And even after he dies, he just doesn't get it. And, and he wants Lazarus to serve him. Father Abraham says, that's not how this works. There's this chasm between us. We're not, we're not on the same planet in thinking this through. Verse 27, then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers and want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone raises them from the dead. The third pitfall Uh, that this man just can't get over is his influence. Now he thinks he can be the savior. I'm going to save my family. Problem is he still hasn't understood the change that actually needs to take place. The change that needs to take place for him and for his family is not information, it's transformation. He still can't even address Lazarus. He still can't even address the problem that they had. Send Lazarus to do what I want him to do to save my family. Then I can be a hero. He's got a savior complex. And he still thinks that Lazarus should be his servant to do whatever he wants to do. And now it's, I can be a savior. I can make this great impact. I can give people the information. Father Abraham comes back and says, they have the information. They can read their Bible. 
haven't they read Moses and the prophets? Isn't that enough? And he says, no, no, that's not enough. But maybe if somebody came back from the dead. It's the third pitfall. It's this, this idea that I, I have enough to save everybody. I can save the world. I can save my family. I, I, I go do my bidding and, and save the people that I want saved. But he's still focused on information, not transformation. Father Abraham is saying they have enough information. They have the Bible. The Bible talks all about what justice is and caring for the poor. If they had read the prophets, if they had read Moses, they would know how to, how to, how to really live a successful life. A successful life is serving other people, caring for other people, loving other people, finding those in needs and giving yourself to them. They should know that. They have the Bible. And he says, no, they're not going to know it. And that's the point. They've got enough information, but it's about transformation. They don't yet understand that. So we see that there's these three pitfalls. You know, the, the, this, this status, the control, and the influence that thinks this is what makes me successful, and this is how I can be successful, and this is even after he's dead. He's like, these are the things that, that make me who I am, and yet he's forgotten about just being a compassionate, loving person who serves other people's needs. That, that that's the whole point. And there's three main objections that have come back to the man that he is struggling against. They're important. We've already read all of them, but let me point them out to you. One of them is that there's a chasm between them. There's, there's this chasm that you can't bridge. The second is there's a Bible that they don't understand. Right, well, you know, send, send Lazarus to my brothers to warn them. Well, they have the Bible. Well, they, they don't get it. They obviously don't get it. And then the third one is, and what hope do we have if they wouldn't even listen to someone who would come back from the dead? And here is maybe what's becoming obvious now is that in all of those objections, the foreshadowing here is that Jesus is going to fulfill all of them. That, that in Jesus, we see a fulfillment to the chasm. Well, how is this chasm going to be bridged? Is that Jesus is going to die forgiving the world, forgiving everybody of all their mistakes, all their sins, all of the things that, that keep them away from where God is. All that's going to be done away. Jesus will die and forgive people. And what about the Bible? That, well, we didn't understand it. We had the information, but we didn't get it. Well, we realized that in Jesus, all of the scriptures are fulfilled. Everything that might be foggy or we don't understand it's still going to be difficult, but we realize now it was all leading to the Messiah, who is Jesus, who embodies all of the laws. And what do we find when, when Jesus is at the pinnacle of everything? That the way we fulfill all the laws and all the prophets is to love God and to love other people. That that's a truly successful life. And I don't even know if they would listen if somebody would come back from the dead. And Jesus, who was crucified for giving the world, would be risen from the dead to give people life. The foreshadowing here is that Jesus would fulfill all of the problems and in doing so would give humanity everything that they need to be successful in life. Not a meritocracy, grace. You have everything that you need because Jesus has given you more than enough. He's forgiven you, died for you showed you what real love looks like by loving you and then defeated death to invite you into a new kind of life. But what about all the status and all the control and all the influence that I work so hard to get? Well, listen, that's not the way God has designed life. That's a meritocracy. You have to earn it all and you have to keep it up and it's exhausting and you're going to be too busy and you're always going to wonder what people are thinking about you you're always going to be trying to keep up and you're going to you're trying to compare yourself to others and even to your past self. Or you step into grace. Who's Lazarus? The one who God helps. It's all of us. It's the ones who say, my life isn't about all the things that I've achieved. It's about receiving more than enough from the one who gives me everything. So listen, if we don't deal with our unhealthy attachments to status, control, and influence, we're never really going to achieve a truly successful life that Jesus offers. See, some of us, we're going to say, uh, kind of like the rich man, or maybe we won't say it, but in the back of our minds we'll say, I would love to volunteer my time. I'd love to serve other people. I'd love to take care of people that don't have enough. I'd love to volunteer at the church on a regular basis. I'd love to serve my community in, in really practical ways that help people. I would love to give time and energy to that, but I'm too busy because I, I work too much. Because our family calendar is so packed. 
You say, if that's true, if you're too busy because of your job to really serve and love people on a regular basis, if you're too busy because there's something on the family calendar every night, we're taking the kids to this lesson and this sport and this thing and, and this commitment and it's always packed up. Why are you doing that? Why would you live that way? Do you think that's the way to success? I'm trying to build up status or money. I'm trying to kind of control what our family is like and how people think of me and all that kind of, I'm trying to have a great influence and, and do all these things so that people think I'm great. I don't think that's a successful life. Why would you live that way? You go, well, I have to. I work to make all this money. I, you, I get it. We have to work. We make money. That's good. But if you're working so much because you need to make more money and oh, I couldn't take a pay cut to, live, to do something else because I'd make less money and, and all that. Really, is that success for you? Is that what you're measuring? I have to work this much and I have to burn the candle at both ends and I have to kind of sacrifice too much family time and I can't really care for other people and I can't really volunteer at church and I can't really get involved in my community. Is that success for you? I just want you to think about that. Some of us are going to be like the rich man. We're just too occupied with trying to build the success and the control and influence that we're never really going to be able to give our time and serve other people. I think we, we live a rich life when we serve other people, when we love other people in really practical ways. Some of us are gonna, we're gonna fall into a trap on the other side. We're gonna volunteer our time. We're gonna say yes to everybody who asks us to do something. We're gonna fill up our calendar with, I'm gonna help this person and my family. Everybody in my family needs help and everybody at church needs help and everybody in my neighborhood needs help and we're gonna get burnt out and even resentful and some of us have experienced that. I feel like I'm giving more than I have to give and I don't know how to say no. And what's the problem with our boundaries? The problem here is that we, 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 we haven't dealt with our motivations and the underlying reasons why we serve people for some of us. See, some of us are serving people because in, in doing that, we're actually trying to gain status and control and influence. We want people to think, look how great they are. They serve everybody. They always say yes to everything. We want to control people, how they think of us. And oh, if I do all these things, then people will approve of me. Maybe even that God will approve of me. Or I'm going to have this great influence. You know, in my circles, pastor circles and colleagues and friends that I talk to, well, this is one of our, our big pitfalls in ministry. See, we all start, we want to help people, care for people, their spiritual needs and emotional needs and physical needs. But creeps in to the back of our mind is, but how big is my church and how big is our budget and how many more ministries we could do and what kind of stories could we tell? You go, wow, now we've crossed over from just really living lives of service to just doing what the rich man is doing, but from another perspective, we're still just trying to give ourselves what we think we need instead of realizing that we have been given everything that we need. Jesus has closed the chasm between God and us. He's forgiven us. He showed us what, what everything that God wants, us, wants from us in the Bible is all about love, which starts with him loving us. He showed us what real influence is like, which is giving your life away, but not with no boundaries, not, not, not to the point where where you're joyless and where you have nothing to the point where you say, I give of myself because I live out of a place where I already know that I'm approved, I'm loved, I'm cared for, I'm forgiven. It's not because I have to do this. It's because I'm compelled that I am loved so much that I can love other people because I'm already successful in God's eyes. See, here's what I think real success is in God's eyes. True success is not doing something great. It's becoming someone great. It's who we are, not what we do. But what we do will flow out of who we are. We realize that, that who we are is something that's given to us. It's given to us by God. It's received in grace. And when we do that, we can live in such a way where we don't have to chase all the wealth and all the money and all the status, all that kind of success. That we can be in a much better and a healthier place to say, I don't need to make a, a gazillion dollars. I just need to make enough to live off of. I can be content. And we also don't have to think, I have to be the savior of the world and fix everything. We can trust that we have a savior who's the savior of the world. His name is Jesus, which means we can come to a healthy place to say, as I realize I've received everything I need for life, I can give my life to other people. I can give my best yes to people who are in need. And I can also say no when I, when I, when I really realize that's uh, outside of my bounds and, and I'm really only tempted to do something because of uh, what I think it's going to bring me. And so then we can live in a place of, of healthy love and service because true success is not doing something great. It's being someone great. And you're someone great. Beloved child of God, 
It's created. Nobody can take that away from you. No, nobody can rob you of that. You don't have to earn that. We don't live in a meritocracy. We live in the grace of God. So I'll tell you a story. It's a story from Tony Campolo. And forgive me if you've heard it before. I've told it before. But uh, Tony Campolo, he's a preacher and an author and a, a, a professor. And uh, one day he's on a train and he sees two men uh, that are just kind of in eye shot of him uh, across the aisle. And just as the train gets out of the station and goes a little while, uh, not too far down the track, one of the men starts violently shaking. He's having a seizure. He falls off his chair onto the floor. The other man quickly jumps into action. He cradles the man. He pulls him back up. He, he rolls up a newspaper and sticks it in his mouth so he won't bite down on his tongue. And he holds him there so that he's safe until he stops shaking. He says he shook for probably a minute straight, but it felt like so much longer. It was a disturbing scene. Everybody around us stopped and was just a little bit on edge going, thinking, what, what just happened here? What did we witness? The man who had a seizure, uh, once he stopped shaking violently, he, he fell into a deep sleep. The other man looked at, at Mr. Campolo and he said, I, I have to apologize for what you've just seen. I'm sure that was, that was kind of traumatizing for you. You see, my friend, he, he has these seizures. He, he has this, this condition and they found out a number of years ago. And, and this happens from time to time. We never know what's going to happen. And so somebody needs to stay with him uh, 24 hours a day to be with him. So I, I sold my, my condo and I moved in and we became roommates and I follow him everywhere that he goes so that if something like this happens to him, somebody's there for him and I can make sure that he's okay and administer his medicine and, and he'll be all right. But I'm sorry you had to witness that. And Paul looks back and says, you don't have to apologize to me. That's an amazing thing that you've done. It's incredible that you would sacrifice that much. You would give that much of yourself to do this. And he says, well, don't praise me too much. See, you don't understand. We, we served in the war together. We fought in Vietnam together. And one day we were behind enemy lines and we were fighting and, and I was badly injured. I couldn't walk. I was stuck there. And, and while we were there and I was so injured, uh, the helicopter that was sent to take us out of that region, it was blown out of the sky. And not only did I have injuries, but he had injuries too. He was in really rough shape. Somehow he came to me and, and he grabbed onto my shirt and he started dragging me out of the jungle. And I don't know how he did it. He was almost as hurt as I was. And I didn't think we were going to make it. But somehow he dragged me all the way back to safety. And Paul's looking at him saying, what an incredible story. I can't believe that. And then he said, what he told me next, I will never forget. He looked at me, said, mister, after what he did for me, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for him. Here's what I think is a really successful life. Is when we come to realize that everything that we need for who we are, to who we're becoming, has been given to us by Jesus. And when we realize that he has given us more than enough we can stop and look around and in a really healthy place say, after what he did for me, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for him. And so a successful life is one where we realize we can give our lives away in service to people and in love of God because he has given us more than enough. And so Heavenly Father, we say thank you. Thank you for the cross of Jesus. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you've given us everything that we need and God help us to live out of that reality, out of that identity and therefore to already be successful in your eyes. And as we realize that, give us the strength to give that kind of love away as we volunteer our time and energy and as we care for the people who are around us in, in all sorts of different ways. And there we believe that we find the rich life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. And it's his, his name that we pray. Amen. As we finish this series, I think one of the main things we've seen over and over again is how valuable it is to be in God's presence, to live our day-to-day -day lives in His presence, um, but to live a truly rich life. It's just knowing and believing that God is more than enough for us, trusting that God gives us more than enough. And so we just wanted to end um, together in worship and uh, singing a song that just invites God's spirit to wherever you're at this morning, if you're out in nature or in your living room, just invite him to invade the space that you're in and to speak to you. So let's just worship together.
has nothing worth more that can never come close. Nothing can compare your living hope.
Well, today's message has definitely been a good challenge. It's so easy to define success based on the things we achieve or things that are easy to measure. But when we remember that real success is about being who God created us to be, it changes our whole perspective. I hope this series has been helpful as we've been reminded over and over and over again that God has given us more than enough. And when we trust in him, we can experience a deep and rich life. As we wrap up the series, we have a number of ways for you to respond in practical means. First, we've heard from many of you that God has inspired you to express your generosity as you've been challenged to respond in your finances. As a church, we think this is a really important part of following Jesus. When we all come together and give sacrificially, God multiplies our resources as we seek to spread his love across the world. We are so thankful for people like you who step up and give sacrificially. If you're someone that's maybe been thinking about giving for the first time, increasing your monthly gift, you can do so easily by clicking the give button on our website and following the instructions. We really couldn't do any of the things we do without your generosity. So thank you so much. Secondly, another way we can respond is to serve our community. And a great way to do that is through our upcoming project called Team Up to Clean Up with Clean and Green Hamilton. We're hosting a community clean up day that's happening Saturday, June 5th from 10 a.m. to noon. We'll be meeting in the church parking lot to hand out supplies such as gloves, garbage bags, and maps to target areas to clean up within the church neighborhood. So visit our website or click the link below to sign up for more details. We hope everyone can participate as we help to make a positive impact and difference in our community. And finally, one more powerful way to respond to what we've been learning about is to get baptized. If you've decided to follow Jesus and haven't been baptized, this is a really powerful symbol to proclaim how Jesus has given us new life. We'd love for, to help you do that and celebrate with you. We're planning a baptism service as soon as we can do so safely. And this might be the perfect time for you to go public with your faith. If you'd like to be part of that or just to talk more about that, Sign up by clicking the link in the video description and we'll help you walk through the process. Now, as we wrap up today, I want to let you know about our new series starting next Sunday and it sounds awesome. It's called The Problem with the Bible. If you've ever read the Bible closely, you've probably had some serious questions or run into some problems with it. So we're going to be tackling questions like, does the Bible contradict itself? What about all the violence? Is the Bible even reliable? And a lot more. This is a perfect time to invite friends or family who may be skeptical about Christianity or aren't normally into church. It's going to be super interesting and helpful, and I can't wait. So enjoy your long weekend, and don't forget to invite someone to tune in with you next Sunday. See you then.